Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of Marvel's What If Season 2 Episode 7, What If Hella Found the Ten Rings. I'm back, people! Well, sort of. I'm still technically on paternity leave after my baby boy was born earlier this month. And a huge thanks to Jessica, to John, to everyone on the New Rockstars team for covering for me. But I'm just back for now, filling in for Jess for this one episode just to give her a breather because she's been working so hard. And you are going to start to see me a bit here and there in the next week before I am back full time in early January. But we got to talk about this episode because what if Hela found the Ten Rings finally gets to the bottom of that growl Odin gave to Loki. Father. Hey! And it's because Asgard Santa Claus is a real turd. I'm going to break down this episode scene by scene for all the Easter eggs, the animation details, and one huge missing piece of the MCU puzzle that this episode finally answers about the origin of the Ten Rings. We're gonna get to it. We open with the ceiling fresco in the Palace of Asgard, the one that Hela uncovered with Scourge and Thor Ragnarok after Odin had wallpapered over her history as the original wielder of Mjolnir and Odin's executioner in his conquest of the Nine Realms before Thor was ever born. Now, those Nine Realms are actually depicted in the form of these nine sigils in the upper left corner here. Of these, I'm not sure which of these sigils is which, but the Nine Realms are Asgard, Midgard, aka Earth, Jotunheim, Svartalfheim, aka the Dark World, Vanaheim, Nidavellir, Muspelheim, and Alfheim, which is home of the Light Elves, like that one little butthole we met in She-Hulk. In this art, Hela rides the wolf Fenris, based on Fenrir in Norse mythology. Odin has his trike Petra symbol before him. That's what appeared on Mjolnir when he whispered his incantation into it. And we see Odin carrying his spear, Gungnir, which becomes an important MacGuffin later in the story. But most importantly, Odin is wearing a different crown than we've seen before. This is actually a very similar antler design as the headpiece worn by Hela. So really, Hela's overall appearance isn't like a villainy that's unique to her. She really inherited this thorniness from her father. And I love how in this ceiling painting, the ring border of it is moving. The Bifrost bridge is shimmering, the halo behind Hela's head and her close-up is rotating as well. So at one point, this art was really alive in order to show the cycle of Asgardian history. Because yeah, it is a cycle. Things like Ragnarok is really part of a repeating event in Norse mythology. The Watcher says, In a campaign of fire and blood. Fire and blood is also the name of George R. R. Martin's historical text that formed the basis of the House of the Dragon series on HBO, which documents the inner conflicts of the Targaryen dynasty during the Dance of the Dragons. And that drama similarly begins when a father denies his firstborn daughter the throne due to some patriarchal bullshit. It's just so interesting to see Hela this episode transition from a Western mythological tradition, Norse mythology, to a world with roots in Eastern mythology, the Ten Rings, the realm of Talo, and in doing so, unlocks a greater power that she was denied in her male-dominated world. This prologue also focuses on the societies that Odin and Hela conquered, including cultures akin to the Frost Giants of Jotunheim and the Dark Elves of Svartalfheim. Joining Odin and Hela in this conquest were the Valkyrie Or. That's the legion of Pegasus-riding warriors that Valkyrie belonged to and the ones who Hela attacked when she was in hell. We saw that in Ragnarok. And I think they show us all this at the beginning of the episode in order to show Asgard not presented as they've normally been as heroes, but rather as mass murderers, much like Thanos in the Black Order. Kate Blanchett returns to voice Hela in this episode, and we see the moment Odin banished her to hell for wanting to continue their conquest beyond the Nine Realms. Apparently, that dispute involved Hela killing a bunch of Odin soldiers because, yeah, Heimdall's observatory is carpeted with corpses here. The Watcher says the Allfather imprisoned her in hell, and it's spelled H E L L in the closed captions, which is weird because we know from the closed captioning in Loki season one, episode four, that an H-E-L hell exists in the MCU. Hell with one L is really known as the Norse afterlife for punishment. But it seems like according to the Watcher, they're one in the same. While you could say the first episodes of the season have ignored the classic one altered detail element of the what if format, these recent episodes have really returned to form. Instead of banishing Hela to hell, Odin goes further breaking Mjolnir and banishing Hela to Midgard, placing a similar spell on her helmet that he placed on Mjolnir in the very first Thor film. So really, the what if scenario here is what if Hela, rather than just being banished out of sight and out of mind, was given the Thor treatment and walked through those story beats and learned from a society, but not a society of like New Mexico astronomers and astrophysicists, but from Wen Wu in the Society of the Ten Rings. But also, instead of a worthiness charm, it's a charm based on mercy. Whosoever wears this crown, should she know mercy, shall possess the power of Hela. This poses a really interesting question. Like if others like Steve Rogers had always been worthy of Mjolnir, who else in the MCU could have had an innate mercy enough to don Hela's crown? Like Captain Carter, Wanda Maximoff, she's already got a tiara. Also doesn't have to be a she. And I love how Odin catches Mjolnir the same way Hela does in Thor Ragnarok and the fracture lines, the broken pieces hit the ground just like they do in that film. Also this noise that Odin makes as he throws the crown reminds me of the snarl that he makes at Loki. Hey! Hey! 
So whereas Thor landed in New Mexico in a pillar of Bifrost light, Hela crash lands in a fiery smoke trail, kind of like the angel Lucifer being cast out of heaven and crash landing. But Hela arriving in China this way actually aligns with the origin of the Ten Rings. The prologue to the Shang-Chi film speculated that Wen Wu found them in a crater. Hela's crown takes the place of Mjolnir as the artifact that is in this storm-swept crater from the 2011 Thor film. And I love how you always see Hela's reflection reflected in that helmet, as if her own appearance is there reflecting back at her taunting her lack of mercy, but it would only reflect that if it had been coated in rain. So because the Norse gods are so associated with storms, you know, you have the god of thunder, every boom is, is supposed to be some other Norse god fighting with another Norse god, that slick rain is what reminds Hela that she is no longer part of that pantheon. Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. You can love holiday season and also admit that it's stressful. Travel, time with family, marking time with New Year's, it can be a lot. And if you feel like you could use a little help with it all, try connecting with a life Licensed therapist by using BetterHelp. Starting therapy can be hard. The right therapist for you may not be in your area, and some people struggle with the face to face interaction of therapy. With BetterHelp, you can have your therapy sessions as a phone call, as a video chat, even via messaging if you prefer that, whatever is the most comfortable version of therapy for you. Just click the link in the description and answer a few questions about what you're looking for from therapy and what your preferences are. BetterHelp will then match you with a therapist from their network that's right for you. If you don't really fit with that therapist, which is a common thing with therapy, you can easily switch to a therapist for no additional cost without stressing about insurance, who's in your network, or anything like that. If you think that you might benefit from therapy, consider BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com slash new rock stars. Clicking that link helps support this channel and also gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp so that you can connect with a therapist and see if it helps you. So we see Wen Wu with five of the Ten Rings glowing blue on his wrist, which is a similar gunslinger pose that we saw of Wen Wu in the flashback prologue of the Shang-Chi film. The Watcher says, Like the Ten Rings that fueled his power. Xu Wen Wu knew all too well the most powerful forces on Earth hmm. often come from beyond. And Wen Wu looks up at the stars, which tells us that his ten rings fell to Earth from the cosmos. After the opening credits, the Watcher even doubles down and says something far more intriguing had fallen from the heavens. So it's suggested that the ten rings in every universe fell from the sky. Hela hears Wen Wu's men speaking Chinese, and she speaks back to them in Chinese, but when Wen Wu responds to her, it's in English. So they're both multilingual. While Hela's status as an Asgardian might be what's giving her the knowledge of all the languages of Midgard, Wen Wu's similarly extended life has made him this sort of multicultural godlike figure. By the way, Wen Wu this episode is voiced by Fyodor Chin, an actor that I actually know from the LA comedy scene, and a prolific actor and voice actor. You go, Fio! Good job, man! Hella brushes her hair back, but no antler crown extends the way it would have if this were Thor Ragnarok, and Hella gets punched across the face in slow motion, which reminds us of the first time another green-cloaked Norse demigod got hit this way in the opening minutes of the Loki episode 1. Like the Loki series, this episode takes a Thor villain and reassigns their glorious purpose from selfishness to noble heroism. Loki transitioned from the god of mischief to the god of stories. Hela goes from the goddess of death to the goddess of light or liberation. Either way, you love to see it. Hela pretends to beg Wen Wu's soldiers to, quote, show mercy on her, forgetting that Odin had just banished her for her inability to show mercy. Wen Wu binds Hela with the Ten Rings, and she says, That power. It is not of this realm, nor are you. So let's talk about what this episode is telling us about the Ten Rings. The Marvel's film disproved the theories that the Ten Rings might have had a Kree origin, so at that point we just started to assume, well, they probably had some connection to Kang, right? Well, now I'm wondering if these Ten Rings might have had an Asgardian origin, another one of Odin's lost relics. Instead of summoning Kang, the rings could be summoning the Norse god of stories in Idrisil, like these rings just automatically call to the closest thing the universe has to an Allfather. Like, notice how later Odin says, the Ten Rings do not belong in these primitive hands. I think the implication is that Odin is at least familiar with these rings, or he might have actually owned them in the past. That could be why they glow the same color blue as the Tesseract in the Casket of Ancient Winters. So we replay the events of the 2011 film here. Like Thor struggling to lift Mjolnir in the rain, Hela is now screaming in agony at her failure to lift this crown from the crater. And I love how they even animated the same slow motion raindrops flinging off her hair, just like how Kenneth Branagh shot that scene in the film and was so over the top, but awesome. Wen Wu now takes a liking to Hela and invites her to uh, 
kind of culturally appropriate. But he says that red is seen as a color of good fortune and that brides wear it on their wedding days. And red was featured so prominently in the wardrobes of Shang-Chi and the warriors of Ta Lo and Wen Wu's wife, Ying Li, is wearing red when they get married. Take their photo. This episode is set at least 1500 years in the past, long before Wen Wu would meet Ying Li because Hela was banished by Odin before Thor was born. Thor is 1500 years old. In this episode, Hela refers to Thor's mother, Frigga, as Odin's new girlfriend. So Thor hasn't even been born yet. Hela attacks Wen Wu, tears off her sleeve, she flees on the rooftops, and the imagery reminds me a lot of Ang Lee's photography in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon when Jen steals the Green Dynasty sword and glides through the rooftops. Some amazing wire work there. That film, obviously a huge influence on the Shang-Chi film, a film that brought back Michelle Yeoh in a less significant role, but you know, it would be a sin to not include her at all in that movie. And I love how Hela is running toward a full moon and it is shaded green, which is her natural color, but she falls from it. This episode shows Hela having to unlearn that green means go and kind of stops seeing red as a stoplight. Hela meets Morris, the adorable furry pet from Talo that was kept by Trevor Slattery in the Shang-Chi film. Morris leads her through that same enchanted bamboo forest that he led Shang-Chi and Katie and Trevor through, but this maid leads her directly into Talo. There is no extra step of the waterfall cave like we saw in that film, so I'm wondering if in these 1500 years they might have added this extra step because people were just like successfully completing the maze by accident. Hela says, I've not survived a thousand years of war to die at the hands of foliage. I don't know, maybe it's just me. I think it's an interesting line considering Loki's fate after thousands of years will be in the roots and the vines of foliage, the Yggdrasil tree. Hela gets attacked by Jai and Morris tries to warn her. Right yeah, it kind of sounds like Morris purred right behind. Jai is wearing the same green dress and wide brimmed bamboo hat in the mask that Ying Li wears when she first fought Wen Wu and Shang Chi. She uses similar airbending magic and was probably part of the same lineage. When Hela wakes up, she sees a flock of phoenix like firebirds. These are Feng Huangs, and we saw these in Ta Lo in the Shang Chi film, among all the other mythological creatures. Heimdall notices that Hela disappeared from his view. She's off the grid. And the fact that he and Odin are so shocked by this suggests to us that the magic of Ta Lo represents a realm with a kind of competing claim on Earth, like it's separate from the magical forces of Asgard, and that other than Asgard, there are other godlike mythological forces that have a stake in Earth's success, or might be trying to conquer Earth. There's just like deeper unexplored horizons beyond Talo and all those ancient civilizations that Michelle Yeoh's character talked about in the Shang-Chi film. So they agree to train Hela, and to keep her in check, they show her the great protector dragon, whom we remember fighting the Dweller in Darkness in the Shang-Chi film. Heimdall reports to Odin that Hela went off the grid and that she's near the Ten Rings, and we see that Odin's throne has twin snake heads. This golden throne did not look like this in the 2011 Thor film, so this era of Odin truly is a more aggressive era of Odin. This is not the Odin we know. Jai teaches Hela, uh, forgive me if I mispronounce this, Jaja, which is the term for Chinese paper folding. It's not to be confused with the Japanese origami. Jai calls it the art of making something out of nothing. Now, the Chinese are one of the world cultures known to have invented paper, along with the Egyptians, who of course used papyrus. A eunuch scribe of the Han Dynasty named Kai Lun was attributed with this paper making technique back in 202 BCE to 220 CE. So even this paper itself was the Chinese making something out of nothing. Jai goes on. Of finding infinite possibility in the blankest of canvases. Hmm, this sounds like something the Watcher would say. We are seeing Hela evolve from a warrior with a fixed mindset to a growth-minded artist that's open to new ideas and new shapes the multiverse can fold into. Jai uses the discipline of laundry to break down Hela's desires, returning her to this childhood memory. When Odin first leashed a puppy version of Fenris, and Hela realizes it's not the Ten Rings or the Throne of Asgard that she wants, but instead... Freedom. Freedom from control. The freedom to choose my own path. And for once, notice how Kate Blanchett's voice transitions from haughty and privileged to just airy and unburdened. Now, this uh, education and training montage may feel like the trope we've seen too many times. Doctor Strange, Batman Begins, Iron Fist, a privileged white person goes to the Far East to learn their wisdom and then comes out of it as their enlightened champion and somehow better at it than they are. Yeah, I think we've all had enough of that, but at least in this case, it's a goddess learning that the mortal approach to existence is better. Sometimes messy humanity is better than divine perfection. When Hela goes off to confront Odin, her tall armor is mostly red, but with green bamboo strips woven through. These colors reflect the way Hela has embraced the red fortune color of her new environment, but holds it together with that green warrior spirit that she still can't part ways from. Now, I don't know about you, I thought it was kind of weird that Odin begins this episode scolding Hela for not showing enough mercy, for not joining him in ending the conquest, but then, just merely upon learning that this Chinese warlord and his daughter have the Tun Rings, he reverts to his old conquering ways and becomes a huge prick. I think it's just a reminder that Odin 1500 years ago was more of a 
temperamental asshole. You could also say maybe he doesn't want any of Midgard's cultures other than his chosen Norse people to have access to these god weapons, which, ew, yikes. That would be really shitty Odin, but I guess it's also worth remembering that all those asshole gods of Omnipotent City really seem to only care about their particular people who worship them because it is a society that worships them that gives them their power. This is exactly how Santa Claus works. I'm not saying it's right. I think Gore should have killed all these guys, but it does inform their old problematic selfish way of thinking. Hela tells Wenwu that they need to get Gungnir. Odin has had this spear since the first Thor film and it actually comes from Norse mythology. It's known as the Spear of the Heavens or really the Swain one is what it translates to. It can pierce whatever it's thrown at, but this I believe is the first time in the MCU the term Gungnir was actually used. Like Tony, Cap, and Thor teaming up against Thanos in Endgame, Hela and Wenwu join together in these well-timed coordinated strikes on Odin. Remember, before Thanos, Odin was considered the Thanos S conqueror of that time. That's why Thanos waited to move until right after Odin died. At one point, we see Wenwu using five of the rings to pry the spear out of Odin's hands. Wenwu does this again later to move the spear into Hela's hands. I just love the fight animation here. And Gungnir accidentally creates these fire knives that Hela flings at Odin, which frustrates him so that he grabs one of the 10 rings, which shocks Wenwu, but it proves that Odin's strength as Allfather and his possible connection to these rings origin. But this decision to grab one of the rings is what Hela exploits. She uses a more passive maneuver that she learned from Jai to weave down Odin's spear and slip it out of his grasp. And now with Odin exposed, when Wu puts all the 10 rings on one wrist and punches him right in the cheek. Hela offers Odin mercy. And while Odin rejects it, that choice is what rattles Hela's crown, deactivates the mercy charm, and the crown returns to her and it transforms her, giving her new bright silver armor. And at this sight, Odin cannot help but concede. And in the end, you eclipsed even my wildest expectations. You eclipsed me. I like the idea of her being the goddess of light because it would tie in with Odin using this astronomical term eclipse to describe the power shift because the Norse gods have always been associated with the stars and the heavenly bodies. So the Watcher explains that this alliance between the armies of Asgard and the Ten Rings created an empire of liberators. We see these liberators charging in to Zeho Beret. That's a civilization that Thanos called in the flashback of Infinity War, Gamora's people. And we're seeing the moment that Thanos took young Gamora under his wing, a moment that we know was so important to him, that is what he saw the moment he snapped. That's where he went. This this right here is one of Thanos' nexus moments. And it's so thematically important that this episode comes back to this moment because Thanos using Gamora as his executioner and then disposing her is basically what this era of Odin is doing to Hela. But the Watcher's narration suggests that even Thanos can change from this moment on. Like we know that universes exist where Thanos is a good guy and season one's what if T'Challa became Star-Lord. It was T'Challa's innate goodness that was enough to warm Thanos' heart. And in this case, it's the principles of Talo and the mercy forgotten by even the gods who blessed us with it. Hey, inspired by what if we are rolling out a new project in the week ahead, an insanely in-depth video series called New Rockstar's What If, and the first episode is gonna explore an alternate historical timeline in which Edgar Wright did direct Ant-Man. We're so proud of this video. It's gonna look real different from anything else you've seen on New Rockstar's. We're gonna talk about why things really fell apart there, and more importantly, what would have happened in the MCU if things went differently. And that, plus some other big 2024 announcements in the next few days. So if you haven't already, please watch Jessica Clemens' breakdown of episode six and all the other episodes of this season. Subscribe to all three channels in the New Rockstars Network. Support what we do by grabbing one of our great merch designs from nerdriot.shop. You can follow me at EA Voss. Thank you so much for watching, and I'm going to go back to taking care of my kid. I'll see you soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye.